At this time, I'd call the meeting of the Sheboygan County Board to order. At this time, I'll call the meeting of the Sheboygan County Board to order. Uh, are we in compliance with the open meeting law? The agenda is posted on January 13th at 10 a.m. Yeah, we're in compliance, and at this time, would you all rise and join me in simply saying the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, thank you. At this time, we'll have roll call. You'll notice there's someone missing tonight. Uh, uh, Chairman Wagner took ill with the flu last night and called me this uh, afternoon and said he will not be able to attend tonight. So we wish uh, him the best wishes and uh, a speedy recovery. I have to talk to the uh, IT director and see if we can get this microphone fixed. Okay, at this time, um, there's uh, next order of business is voting on roll call. Roll call. Have you all pressed your attend button? Mm -hmm. Twenty-three. And press your I button. Oh, J. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Twenty-three supervisors present. Right, the next order of agenda on the agenda is the approval of the December twentieth journal. <coughs> Supervisor Winkle. Motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Motion to approve. Supervisor Glavin. I'll support that motion. Mr. Motion Chairman. is made and seconded. Are there any questions, corrections, or additions to the uh, journal? <coughs> Hearing none, would you all please vote on the approval of the, the agenda? He's got her button on. What? He's got her button on. Uh, Supervisor Rainer. I was just seconding it. Oh, oh. okay. We're good. Okay, at this time, would you all please vote? That motion is approved unanimously. Next order of, on the agenda is um, presentations. There are none. Next order is public addresses. There are none. Next order of business is letters, communications, and announcements. We have none. And that brings us to the next order of business, the county administrator's report. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, and good evening. Yeah. Glad to see that you got here safe and sound. We've had some interesting weather here of late, and as I was preparing my remarks for tonight, and there's two things I want to cover, uh, transportation and our combined dispatch, but first I want to talk about transportation a little bit and our highway department employees and the tremendous job that they're doing. You know, Sheboygan County is responsible for maintaining 900 lane miles of county roads 356 lane miles of state and interstate highway and 930 lane miles of town roads. So for your math majors out there, that's 2,186 <coughs> lane miles of roads. A lot of roads to take care of when it snows, when we have freezing rain, when we have conditions like we've had the last couple of days. And I imagine from time to time you may hear your constituents say, well, what does it take? Or why does it take so long? Or why does it cost so much? So if you think about just a two to four inch snowfall, an average snowfall, <coughs> no wind, no freezing rain, just a nice gentle snowfall in a 24 hour period, how many staff do we have available? How many pieces of equipment are involved? How long does it take to get our transportation system back in order so it's safe. Well, believe it or not, we have on average 57 employees involved in a situation like that. We're utilizing 45 plows. We also have graders that we can use if need be, but 
on average, 57 employees are involved utilizing 45 pieces of equipment, and in a 24-hour time period, it costs about $125,000 to clean it up. It's significant. If it's an above average snowfall with wind, with the kind of ice conditions that we've been dealing with, taking dramatically more salt, more man hours to get out there in just 24 hours, it's closer to $200,000 for that one event. On average, we go through with nearly 11,000 tons of salt per year at a cost of $800,000 per year. And obviously, the worse the conditions, the slippery it is, the more ice we have, the more salt <coughs> we're putting in place. Suffice it to say, it costs millions. It costs millions of dollars each year to keep our transportation system maintained and safe during the winter months. Some of the folks from Florida and others don't have to worry about this so much. We do in the Midwest, and it's costly. And our staff, our staff do a tremendous job. Our county highway department employees are on call 24-7, 365 days a year. They have to be ready to perform their jobs at any given hour of the day or night, and not just in the winter, obviously. They are call, called upon for any type of weather emergency year-round, including responding to assist law enforcement with automobile crash sites, fires, put up road signage, you name it. Our staff cannot stay home during a winter event. They have to make it through whatever road conditions there are to get to work so that they can open the roads for the motoring public. Most people do not consider highway department employees emergency responders. But they are. They are, at times, the first on the scene of an accident providing aid and calling the Sheriff's Department. Recently, one of our employees was the first on the scene to assist a Sheriff's deputy who was trapped in her vehicle when she was rear-ended on Highway Interstate I-43. I Even more recently, sadly, one of our Highway Department employees was the first on the scene of a fatality. He was the last person to speak to the victim and the first to provide CPR. If our staff is not on the roads doing their job, then police, fire, ambulance personnel cannot get to you and assist you in, when needed. We are so fortunate to have highly skilled and dedicated highway department employees. I think, personally, I think it's just amazing how quickly they can get our roads in good order after a snowstorm. And I think it's equally amazing how impatient some people are. <coughs> so I kindly ask you and those viewers of TV8 and others that may think a little bit about our transportation system and the good work of our dedicated highway em employees to, to thank and appreciate their work, to be patient, and recognize that they are outstanding and important public servants. So again, in light of the weather we've been dealing with and how treacherous this, these icy conditions have been, I wanted to shout out to our employees who are really doing a nice job. <clears throat> Speaking of good work, I also wanted to talk a little bit about our combined dispatch center. And as you know, governing is hard work. It's heavy lifting. Collaboration is clearly an important key to success. And earlier this month, Mayor Vandersteen, who's with us this evening, asked Chairman Tom Wagner and I to go to the City Common Council to talk a little bit about combined dispatch and the very impressive collaboration that's occurred between the County Board and the Common Council. And we both took that opportunity and enjoyed the opportunity that <coughs> evening. Uh, Mayor Vandersteen presented us with the two and a half million dollar check, their, the city's contribution toward combined dispatch, and we took that opportunity not only to talk about combined dispatch, but a lengthy list of a number of opportunities we've worked together to make good things happen. And I sent that all to you as an email attachment earlier this afternoon. But for nearly three decades, there were discussions to combine our dispatch center between the police department, the Sheboygan County Sheriff's Department, county board supervisors, and the common council. And finally, finally we negotiated and came to an agreement on a path to get it done. 
The 2016 merger of the City and County Dispatch Center eliminates duplication and provides a single point of contact for all citizens and visitors to access emergency and non-emergency services. It provides a more efficient, effective, and consistent level of service, eliminates the need and delay associated with transferring calls, which is very important, provides for better countywide radio coverage, which is very important, and it's going to help save lives. <clears throat> the county and city were also able to successfully retain and merge most city and county dispatchers, improve working conditions, and provide for a seamless transition. The most difficult challenge, personally, and I think most in this room would agree, was garnering <clears throat> county board support. Support to absorb nearly a one million increase in operating costs going forward because of this co combined service. We picked up the cost associated with the city dispatchers that came our direction. We added a supervi uh, supervisory level that we didn't have before. We certainly raised the bar, but there was an added cost. And the board swallowed hard and approved it because they knew ultimately it was a better and more consistent level of service for the community as a whole. In addition, our radios and equipment was dated. Uh, certainly, Chairman Tom Epping and members of the Law Committee, they know that this is dated equipment because they were doing the heavy lifting during this discussion. And we had not only to make the investment in remodeling our law enforcement center, but we have new dispatch councils, equipment, radios, towers, to a total of about $12 million, of which, again, the city provided two and a half, but this was a major investment in our community. So I just want to say thank you. You probably don't hear it real often from your constituents <coughs> or as you go shopping or uh, go about your day, but thank you, County Board, for your leadership and support. Thank you, Mayor Vandersteen, who <coughs> joined us this evening, for your leadership and support, the Common Council, the Chief of Police and his staff, most of the city dispatchers came our direction. They were wonderful to work with. We made this vision become a reality. It was and is a remarkable achievement. And I think in this line of work, we tend to get things done and we move right on to the next, but it's worthy of a modest pause and to uh, recognize what collectively we accomplished. This evening, I want to particularly thank our staff. And with us this evening is, is Sheriff Todd Preby. If you would please stand and be recognized. Inspector Jim Rousseau, <coughs> Lieutenant Christy Dublay, former Inspector Bill Bruckbauer. I had the pleasure of meeting with these individuals generally every three to four weeks, depending on what was happening. They would give me updates on their progress, and they, they're tremendous. Their teamwork, their collaboration, their problem solving. Uh, I think everyone knows former Inspector Bruck Bauer and the passion he had and the support and recommendations he was making early on in this and for him to come back after retirement and help be a project manager and see it through, uh, I just tip my hat to his public service and willingness to do that. Sheriff Todd Preby came in, he had relationships with the city, so that clearly helped. Inspector Rousseau, what a strong, thoughtful decision maker, leader in the department, and then Lieutenant Christy DeBlay, who worked with the dispatchers and so many of the key staff who are now making this work, her communication skills, attention to detail, follow through with these employees, outstanding. So let's put our hands together. <clears throat> so thank you, and uh, Inspector Rasu, if you could please come forward. I, that concludes my remarks, but I asked Jim at Chairman Wagner's request to just give a brief overview of when we talk about combined dispatch and some of this equipment and radios and towers, if you're on the law committee or if you're Vern, who's a member of the fire department, I mean, you got a pretty good handle on this, but some people may not as much, and there are others certainly watching perhaps on TV8 that, what's this all about? And Jim's gonna give a little bit of an overview.
I just wanted to uh, put together a few slides for tonight because uh, much of this system uh, that the county has spent a great deal of money on um, is behind secure doors and in places where it's normally not viewed. So just to kind of give an idea, uh, put a visual <coughs> to uh, what we've done. Um, this first picture is uh, the new center as of a couple days ago. Uh, we're completely moved in and it's fully operational. Um, much, much larger, much more accommodating than our, our previous center. Um, and so far things are, are working uh, very well. There's always a few bugs and adjustments and things like that to make on when you're dealing with this kind of electronics and equipment, <coughs> but um, overall it's, it works very well and um, we've been using it on a daily basis since um, the 14th of November when we went live out of this center. Uh, how it all began. Uh, this is kind of the in, the in the beginning slide. This is a resolution passed by the county board. Um, it was introduced in 2012 and passed uh, just after the first of the year in 2013. Um, oddly enough, it was just a couple weeks before I uh, became inspector at the sheriff's office, so I, uh, I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming for a year, but um, it was certainly a challenging project to take, take on right out of the chute. Um, but I was very much in the loop. Uh, former Inspector Brock Bauer, uh, I've been working with him, shadowing him for uh, a year already, um, so I was pretty much in the know on what was going on. Um, as County Administrator mentioned, uh, we asked Inspector Brock Bauer to come back to be our project manager. Uh, the amount of thought and effort he had put into this idea uh, for many, many years, uh, there's just simply no one that could match it. So uh, we thought it best that he come back um, and manage that side of it because uh, he had much more uh, background and much more depth as far as uh, what the vision of the, the project was. To start with, we had to figure out where are we going to put this center. Um, <laughs> several ideas were floated around as far as location. And as we say, location is everything. Um, the original plan um, introduced years earlier called for expansion of our, our building, expanding the footprint of our building. Uh, that, of course, would be quite expensive because of the nature of our building, having um, thick concrete walls and basically being a, a bomb-proof, uh, weatherproof type building. So that was going to be expensive. So our, our goal was to try and fit it within existing space. Uh, this is a layout from the, the furniture company that did this job of uh, giving us the layout of the furniture and how things would be placed inside that room. Um, this is what it looks like today uh, without the walls. That's basically the layout of our furniture um, in the northeast corner of our building. We also had to displace a number of people, including myself and the sheriff. We had to move to the opposite end of the building where office space was created. Uh, but this proved to be a, a, a very useful and very, a good plan to go forward on. <clears throat> this is uh, what we frequently refer to as the guts room. Um, this is a new radio system. Uh, it's in a temperature controlled and uh, room off the comm center. Uh, it has its own fire uh, system to uh, protect against fires. And uh, that's where essentially the guts or the core of the radio system is. It's a couple million dollars sitting in these racks here, uh, but it runs the entire system. As with many things, you're not going to see a lot of uh, traditional electronic uh, tubes and wires like we used to see. Uh, everything is essentially a computer PC based system uh, run by, by huge processors. So this is what it looks like inside, uh, inside the core room. Um, some of the things that had to happen uh, as the system progressed, the last time we upgraded our system was in 2000. Uh, since that time, uh, many codes as far as radio systems and structures have changed, including electrical codes. So uh, our sites, all of our tower sites, we had six of them at the beginning of this project, we now have seven. All six uh, towers had to be inspected for both load rating and any other code upgrades that would have to take place. Uh, just as an example, this tower uh, was at Highway 67 uh, had to be strengthened. It did not meet the load requirements. So we had, there was some modifications done to the base of that tower. And also, uh, historically, we had, had some problems with the generator. The tower site is actually owned by another party, a uh, communications company. Um, their generator was theirs, um, but it had, it had failed on a regular <coughs> basis. So we took over that responsibility, installed the brand new <coughs> generator, and also made the strength upgrades to the tower. Um, and there's our, our very own homegrown generator. 
that now will power that in case of a power, power outage. This site is, a, is critical um, to the infrastructure of the system because that site also has um, the equipment for paging fire departments. So this site's critical. We can't, we can't have this site go down uh, for any period of time because our fire paging uh, would not be possible without it. This is inside the, uh, uh, the equipment shack at that site. I took this picture last June uh, prior to the new radio equipment being installed, just so you can kind of get an idea what looks what the inside of these buildings look like. Um, this is the old old equipment that had to be somewhat disconnected and pushed aside so we could install new equipment alongside of it. Um, and also if you can see the thermometer up in that, it was maybe 60 degrees out when I took this picture, but you can see it's much warmer in there. Uh, this equipment gives off a lot of heat and these little shacks at the base of these towers have to be uh, constantly uh, temperature controlled. And so air conditioners that will kick on even in the colder <coughs> times of the year because of the equipment is going to generate so much heat. Um, this was an important addition and improvement to our whole system. Um, when the system was upgraded in 2000, there was discussions about the need for a uh, seventh tower site in the southeast area um, along the lake shore, uh, what we affectionately refer to as the Dutch coast. There's some dead spots and dead areas um, that we wanted to try and address. We weren't sure at the beginning of this project we were going to be able to do that uh, because of the, the cost of either building or renting space on a new tower. We left it as an option when we uh, put bids out and uh, negotiated the, the contract with Motorola. We, we left that as a, uh, an option. Um, and we were, in the end, we were able to do that uh, by renting uh, tower space from uh, US Cellular. I also want to point out, as far as our cooperation with other county, uh, county departments, when our nice little shack was about to be delivered, it weighs about 15,000 pounds. Um, we needed to pick that thing up off a truck and set it down. Well, all that stuff weighed more than what the existing road was going to handle. There was simply a small path where they threw some gravel on top of a, a farm field to get into the site, and that simply wasn't going to hold the, the truck or the crane that was needed to lift it off. So on very short notice, uh, Greg Schnell and his highway, highway guys uh, put a road in for us that would hold uh, 100,000 pounds. Um, and they did it pretty much overnight. I think we called them late in the week, and I think Monday and Tuesday the following week that road was in. So he did an outstanding job of uh, meeting a need and keeping us on schedule as far as getting this, this uh, shack installed and getting us in there. This also makes it possible for the highway department to maintain that uh, throughout the future. So if our technicians or anyone needs to access that site, uh, they can get at it. <clears throat> That's the top of the Cedar Grove Tower. Just to give someone an idea of what the top of that tower looks like. This is cell phone equipment and that's cell phone equipment. <clears throat> you rent tower space in 10 foot increments and uh, I believe we rented the space in between these two. There might be some below, but I think we rented uh, 20 or 30 feet of space on that tower. That saved us a lot of money by being able to rent space on an existing tower rather than trying to construct our own. Constructing <clears throat> far more expensive and time consuming by the time all the permits and everything were secured. So we now have a uh, seventh site in operation, uh, which has improved our service in that area greatly. This is an old cover coverage map I found of our county. These red dots are all our existing, were our existing tower sites. Um, the new tower site is what we needed. This was supposed to improve coverage in this area. Pretty much as soon as you uh, travel east down the bluffs near uh, Amsterdam <coughs> Beach in that area, uh, coverage was lost. So um, there's a fair number of people that live down there. Uh, it is somewhat seasonal, but there's still a lot of people that live down there. And we have had calls for service as far as uh, uh, there's a drowning, there's been house fires down there, um, other fires, medical situations, and we really needed to have coverage in that area <coughs> for our services. This is, the new, this is the new map, the new system installed. You see now we have a seventh site there. And the white spotted area along the coast is now gone. So we now have coverage uh, through our coast, <coughs> the Amsterdam Dunes area uh, that the county has acquired, and also uh, even into Ozaki County in ways. So that has, that has solved that issue uh, immensely. Oddly enough, not long after the this system went live, we did have an incident in that area or a gentleman who had suffered a, a medical uh, condition who lives in another area but was 
formerly from the Stego area. Um, we had there was an attempt to locate him. His vehicle was found near the Amsterdam Dunes property, uh, and there was a uh, intense search to try and find him. Uh, as it was weather was he was not going to be able to stand the weather. Um, while that search was conducted by uh, law enforcement and um, city of fire department, they had complete and clear radio coverage the entire time they searched that area for him. And fortunately, he was found in time to get to get the proper assistance. But we got to see some immediate uh, benefits from the from the seventh tower. Um, as many of you know, uh, a second tower, or a uh, new tower had to be built at uh, Taylor Hill. The old tower, which had already been reinforced last time we upgraded our system, uh, simply wasn't uh, capable of reduced new codes, was not capable of uh, holding the load that was going to be on it. So a new tower was built uh, right alongside the old one uh, to meet the new standards. Now this picture was taken before equipment had been transferred to this tower, uh, but all the new equipment is on. This one is now sits idle, and um, sometime in the next month or two, that uh, that tower will be dismantled and taken down. Uh, weather hasn't been the greatest for the tower climbers lately. Uh, but if some of you remember, it didn't go up. It was kind of an amazing thing. It pretty much went up in a, in a single day. They, they constructed that tower. Um, so the expertise and experience that people have in these things is, is nothing short of amazing. The user end. Um, very key component to us is the, uh, the end user products. This is a mobile radio that fits inside any vehicle. And these are the two varieties of portables, uh, portable radios that we, we utilize. Uh, this is one that has dual bands. So we can operate on an analog or digital system, so we can talk to the counties around us that still have analog systems. Uh, this one is a typical one that the fire departments liked. They like the color because it matches a lot of their other equipment. <coughs> but I'm not sure if you can see it, but this version also comes with larger knobs, uh, which is a much sought after fe uh, feature with uh, local fire departments because they can turn those knobs with a glove hand. And typically, their business, they have they have gloves on no matter what time of year it is, so they're able to do that. Um, there was about just over five million dollars in radios purchased as part of this product, part of this project. So that was a huge part of it. Um, we are very pleased with the, these end user products. They contain um, some nice new features for the users. Um, they are crystal clear, going from a digital to a, for, from an analog system to a digital system. It's like going from you know, rabbit ears on your TV to a um, satellite system with high definition TV. It's just much clearer. The voice is crystal clear. <clears throat> and um, one of the new features that is incorporated in these radios, as well as some other manufacturers, is noise canceling features, um, which is invaluable when it comes to um, using these radios at an incident. Uh, there's demonstrations, and we were part of them where someone using one of these radios would stand alongside of a fire truck with pumps running, a chainsaw or a cutoff saw, um, generators, and you could barely hear yourself talk, but they could talk um, in a plain voice in that radio, and the person on the other <coughs> end hears nothing but that, that user's voice. They don't hear any of the background noise. Um, and that is, is nothing short of amazing when it comes to technology. Uh, during some of the testing um, process, we sent uh, so few people out on our, our boat out on Lake Michigan. It was rough that day. Uh, the, out, the outboards were going full tilt, and they said they could not even hear themselves talk. And the wind and the, and the waves of the motors running, um, but in dispatch, uh, they could hear it clear as a bell, and they heard none of the none of the background noise. In fact, they had to stop shouting, <coughs> shouting so loud to hear themselves talk that uh, it was going across too loud. So some outstanding features for our fire, EMS, and, and law enforcement. Another important feature, improvement. Uh, I think there's many people that think this is a 911 system. Um, it's not. Um, in fact, it's not even a phone system anymore. But I just realized that for a fact. Um, this, this is a 911 system. Uh, we spent um, roughly half a million dollars on new 911 software. Um, that allows uh, one screen at each um, dispatch console to be dedicated entirely to 911. Um, in our new center, we can take, uh, we have five, or a total of 10 911 lines coming in, so we can take 10 individual 911 calls at one time, or as many dispatchers as, as can pick up phones. Um, some nice, some of the features on this did not change much um, since the previous version. Um, however, 
one of the components we have on this system is we have um, a, a statistical feature, an analytical feature on this, where um, a supervisor, or in many cases, uh, Lieutenant DeBlay, can look back um, at calls that were received, um, determine peak call times, uh, determine how many 911 calls are received at any given time, whether it's yearly, annually, daily. Uh, one adjustment as far as staffing was already made because of the information gathered from the system. <coughs> where they they uh, took uh, personnel from one shift and moved them towards another shift to better address peak call time. Uh, but there's all kinds of information, even from a personnel management standpoint, um, individual dispatchers, they can look at their own individual uh, habits and techniques and to see if there's improvements or anything that can be made to that area as far as uh, how much time it takes from the time the calls received to the time the resources are dispatched. Um, so there's all kinds of features that are built into the system that can, uh, that can be utilized. I know one of the questions that has come up in the past when combined dispatch was in discussion was how many of 911 calls are received from the city, how many are received from the county. Um, this system has capabilities to analyze uh, much of that. So um, that provides some great tools to move forward and, and manage this, this much larger system. So keys to success. Um, support from the County Board of Supervisors. Um, it, all began, it all began here uh, when that resolution was, was supported and passed. It also needed to be supported from the city council. Well, city council, uh, Sheboygan. Um, those were key components to getting this, uh, getting this started, getting it off the ground. Shared services committee. Um, I went to many of those meetings, and um, the idea kind of blossomed out of shared services committee. And we had a great number of people supporting it, and a great number of discussions <coughs> and resources were uh, were put forward from that committee. Uh, cooperation and leadership from the county administrator and uh, city administrator. Once the resolution was passed and uh, there was a team of uh, people from city and county that met uh, regularly to negotiate an agreement between the city and county, uh, those were some pretty, uh, pretty intense discussion, discussions. Uh, and they were not easy. Um, and I, I guess it would be safe to say that only one meeting ended in total agreement, it was, which was the last one. But in between there, there was a lot of things that had to be discussed. Um, everybody in the room had, had their, the best interests of everyone in mind, but uh, navigating through some of those individual matters uh, was not easy. But uh, everybody was committed to finding a way, and in the end, we uh, reached uh, an agreement. Uh, cooperation leadership of Sheriff Preby and, and Police Chief Don Wielski. I think we would have been very understanding um, had the city been resistant to some of the things that, that came up along the way for a period of time, we decided to move our dispatchers to the city PD while construction and other things were taking place at our own uh, facility and while uh, awaiting the new equipment to arrive and, and be installed. Uh, the decision was made um, partly because of we just needed four complete dispatch consoles to work from. We only had three at the Sheriff's Department, so we moved to the city um, for several months. Uh, the city was very accommodating. Um, basically, anything we needed to make it work, um, they, they accommodated us in their house. Uh, they've been outstanding overall, both from managing the personnel that were there, um, trying to work with their uh, supervision there to make sure communication and everything worked well on their end while we were there. Um, and they were just they were outstanding to work with. Sheboygan County Fire Chiefs. Um, a huge part of what we do is dispatch uh, fire resources to volunteer fire departments. Um, there are 27 departments in this. Um, so that's a lot of, a lot of individuals, a lot of, um, a lot of best intentions and good thoughts and to try and get those all into one place and to come to an agreement from everything from dispatch protocols, to how to, uh, the template that we install on radios as far as what channels and in what order are installed in those portables. Um, that, was a, that was a huge thing. Um, but they were able to get it done and um, come to an agreement. And in the end, I think we've, we've taken a huge step forward in our, uh, in our relationship with those fire departments. Project management by uh, Jim Tabist and, and Bill Bruckbauer, uh, managing both the construction side of the project uh, and the, the personnel and merging uh, side of the project. 
um, was primarily managed by these two, and they did an outstanding, outstanding job. Um, guidance from Finance Director uh, Wendy and um, former uh, Finance Director Terry Hansen. Um, Wendy inherited this project when she became Finance Director. Um, I know she's very appreciative of that. She enjoys the challenge. <laughs> but um, her expertise uh, to help us stay on top of our numbers uh, has been outstanding. Because there was there were times where it was it was difficult. The project was moving fast, so forward, um, assets were being acquired, things were being acquired, and bills needed to get paid. Um, but we needed to know where we were at, um, and she was she's been outstanding in that area. Uh, county purchasing agent uh, Bernie Romer. Whenever it came to purchasing uh, equipment items that were not specifically Motorola radio related, um, Bernie was a guy, and he. Uh, he could turn things around really quick. Now, when it came to negotiating uh, products like our uh, dispatch software, um, he's, he's very good at that. Uh, if you've ever um, worked with him, you understand that you may find the product and you may think you found the best price, and uh, Bernie will almost always get a better price. Um, so, in the end, everybody wins. Uh, technical support, as I talked about from transportation director, um, they're outstanding in getting that road bill built for us. But they also took on the responsibility of installing radios in their own vehicles, um, which took a, a huge burden off of our own, uh, in our own people. <coughs> Personnel guidance and development from our HR director, uh, Gene Gallimore, and Lieutenant uh, DeBlay, working through merging two sets of benefit packages and rules and guidelines and practices, um, that's not easy. <coughs> it was a very difficult part of merging the two work groups from the city and the county. Um, we also understood from the beginning that we really we really had to get it right um, the first time, or at least as much as possible, uh, because we didn't want to lose people. Many uh, counties and cities that merge lose uh, many people, up uh, to 20% or more, they lose uh, just because of the merger. Uh, we were able to create much better statistics that way. Uh, we didn't lose many people at all as far as people who just didn't simply want to make the jump. Uh, but in the end, we were able to hold it together, and uh, those people are, are still with us today um, and have made the trend, successfully made the transition. But they're outstanding in that. Uh, Lieutenant DeBlay, she was the frontline person as far as uh, enduring the stress of transition for the two work groups. Um, she did endure a lot of that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but we were able to endure that. The people uh, working for us were able to endure that. Uh, we made it through. Uh, technical knowledge and skills of our radio technicians from the city and county, George Macias on the county side and Rush Schreiner on the, the uh, city side. Um, it was no secret that these two gentlemen are, are outstanding in their field, that you really learn to appreciate it once you uh, step into a project like this. I think we probably have the two best radio technicians um, for a long way to go to this state. Um, their skills are uh, tapped into by other counties in the area um, and other counties even across the state. Um, George frequently gets calls from the uh, Department of Corrections for their for assistance with some of their systems in their, in their facilities as well. Um, these are two outstanding people with uh, great skills in their, in their field. And uh, technical knowledge and skills of our um, Building Services electrician Mike Mike Zierice. Um, Mike was outstanding. Uh, he even um, even changed the way uh, some of our uh, Motorola people wanted our, our facilities wired. Uh, Mike knows building codes uh, front to back. Uh, actually, uh, it was outstanding as far as doing a lot of the work and saving us a lot of money and time by doing a lot of the work um, within our own people. Uh, city and county dispatchers and supervisors. <clears throat> uh, they had to endure this enormous transition. We had people that had only been here a year, and we have, we have one employee that's been here 42 years, and we have everything in between. Um, it's a lot of change to endure. But not only your physical location changes, every piece of equipment that you touch in the day as part of your job, everything changed. Um, entirely new faces to work with, entirely new policies, procedures, protocols. The city people had to learn about the county, the county people had to learn about the city. Uh, and they had to do that all within a matter of uh, a year or two. So they endured that and have come through it successfully. Uh, I think we have an outstanding uh, 
and very efficient system in, in Com Center right now. Thank you. Continuing on our agenda, consideration of committee reports from the executive committee, ordinance number 10. Regarding repealing and recreating chapter 70 sanitary regulations, committee recommendation to enact. Supervisor Gehring. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I move for adoption of ordinance number 10. Motion is adoption. Supervisor Baumgart. I second that move. Motion is second. For adoption, any discussion? Hearing none, when the clerk opens the roll, please vote. That motion is approved unanimously. Next order of business is uh, ordinance number 11. Re Regarding repealing and recreating chapter 75, erosion control and stormwater management ordinance, committee recommendation to enact. Supervisor Damp. Thank you, Supervisor Chairman, Assistant Chairman. I move to enact uh, ordinance number 11. Thank you, motion is enactment. Supervisor Baumgart. I second that motion. Motion and second for enactment. Discussion? Seeing none, when the clerk opens the roll, please vote. That motion is also approved unanimously. Next order of business is resolutions introduced. Resolution number 30 from the Finance Committee. Regarding carryover of unexpended 2016 appropriations to 2017. Resolution number 30 is referred to the Executive Committee. Resolution number 31 from Planning Resources, Agriculture and Extension. Regarding participating in Snowmobile AIDS Program 2017-2018. Resolution number 31 is referred to the Finance Committee. Next order of business is adjournment. Supervisor Bemis. I move we adjourn. Motion's adjournment. Supervisor Winkle. Second. Motion second to adjourn. When the clerk opens the roll, please vote. We are adjourned.